suspected they were going to eat him when he noticed the distinct lack of Yuletide smells. It wasn't perhaps a conscious thought, at least not one which had been fully realized, but there was a clear growing uneasiness with him. Somehow, he just knew. Surely if a family invited you for Christmas dinner, the house would be filled with the wonderful aromas associated with an annual feast. Succulent roast turkey, honey glazed vegetables, perhaps the fumes of muled wine, or the brandy-covered Christmas pudding. But no, all of these were absent, yet the table was set. It was a particularly bleak Christmas, and while snow was often welcome at the festive time of year, the penetrating cold and frost which seemed to sabotage both homes and their residents' bodies was not. The temperature had plummeted on the 7th, and there had been little sign of any forthcoming reprieve. Families attempted as best they could to reach one another, but for many, it would be a lonely Christmas day. Travel, especially for the elderly, was almost impossible for fear of slipping on the ice. One fall was all it would take for a broken hip or shoulder, and for the more fragile individuals among them, recovering from such an injury was not an easy task. Certainly not as easy as it would be for those of a younger vintage. The Cardinal family had taken pity on the elderly gentleman who had recently moved into the neighborhood only a few streets away. They were of an understanding stock and took part in a local home help initiative, spending time with the old and vulnerable. Everyone knew and loved them. Timmy was the youngest, a boy of only five or six. He was a child whom all looked upon with great adoration, never complaining, never causing trouble, always adorable and his ten-year-old sister, Camilla, was equally admired. They were both a testament to the caring and nurturing parenting skills of Ben and Lucy Cardinal. Every year, as the cold winter drew in, the Cardinal family were admired for their dedication and commitment to those around them, their passion, almost zeal, for helping those less fortunate. But behind the smiles and skin-deep facade of that loving family lurked a far more sinister purpose. They had a tradition every year, a way to reward themselves for their kindness and generosity, one which stemmed back through many previous generations of the Cardinal family. Each Christmas, they would invite a guest for dinner who would be welcomed with open arms into their home, sat down at a beautiful set table provided with humorous and enjoyable Christmas conversation, and then by the light of the roaring fire, the guest would be stabbed to death and eaten gratefully. They all reveled in the old tradition, with Timmy looking forward to it the most. He had a ferocious appetite and a waistline to match it, but kids do get so wrapped up in the anticipation of a family Christmas, and his parents were delighted to see a growing boy fill his belly. Camilla was of a more quiet disposition than her stout little brother. Then suddenly, a massive hurricane spawned in the Gulf of Mexico. The weather forecaster for our local news frequently referred to it as a monster. Looking back, well, I'd believe it was more of a demon. A demon that brought hell with it. 
but a much different one that I had read about in the Bible. The storm passed, leaving devastation for miles around. It had affected every state within the southeast, but Florida most of all. Help was sent from various utility companies, government aid agencies, and even regular citizens to help with the relief. And when I say various, I mean from every state in our region. It was amazing to see the effort put forth to help the people that had lost everything. I'm sure a lot of us thought that was the worst it could get. I wish that was true. But that was when the rain started. As November came, we felt the first droplets in our tiny town. It was an odd occurrence, but not odd enough to raise any eyebrows. I mean, how bad could a couple of days of rain be, right? Well, the problem came when the days turned into weeks, and low-lying areas became flooded. Homes and towns nearby were washed away in a matter of hours once the levees broke. My wife Susan constantly thanked God that our house was nestled on a high elevation among trees. I found myself thinking the same thing, but God had nothing to do with what happened. No God I could ever believe in anyway. Now the week of Thanksgiving, the rain finally subsided. And I'm sure that was something everyone would say they were thankful for. But the problem was, what remained was the cold. That in itself was not strange, but the severity of it was. We saw temperatures close to freezing for the following week. And that was something we rarely saw until late January or early February. My oldest son, Jacob, well, he began singing that silly song by Bing Crosby. My wife beamed at the thought of them seeing snow on Christmas Day. The foolish child in me felt the same. The boys will finally get to see snow, Paul, Susan squealed. I know, I can't wait to see Tommy waddling in it, I responded. Those words, well, they ring in my head now. I have to fight back tears when I think of just how stupid I had been. We were so preoccupied with setting up decorations and buying presents that we were all oblivious to what was happening all around us. The snow actually started falling the first week of December. It was up several inches within the first day. It was amazing to see at first, but when it kept coming days away from the anniversary of my niece's death. No one knows how she died, except her mother, who passed away recently, and me. I do not know who to tell, but I need to tell someone. No one would believe me anyway. They'd lock me up like they locked up my sister. I wouldn't blame them. I hardly believe what happened myself. Bethany was going to be 10 years old the day after Christmas, the year she died. She still believed in Santa. I thought she was too old for that shit, but her parents thought it was cute. They did everything they could to keep her from realising it was just a lie. Bethany loved Christmas, and Santa, and elves, and all that. She used to tell me about an elf that would hide in her house. I just thought her parents must have been hiding a toy elf, or something. But I asked them about it, and they said they didn't have any elf dolls. I thought they were just joking. Bethany's stories about the elf started getting stranger. She told me that one night she woke up to the elf sitting on the dollhouse next to her bed, watching her with its empty glass eyes. After that night, she said the elf turned bad. She said it would move around her room, making strange noises at night 
and she told me if she tried to get out of bed, the elf would run towards her and bite and claw her feet and ankles. The elf, she said, had too many teeth, which were long and thin, but not pointed. She said its nails were long and sharp, like claws. Of course I didn't believe her, but she showed me the scars and new bite marks. The bite marks were normal human sized, but very deep, and definitely with more teeth marks. That's when I started to worry. I thought maybe she was doing it to herself. I thought she may have been seriously mentally ill. I wish I was right. I told my sister my concerns about her daughter. She was worried too, so she found a psychiatrist for her. I thought that would help Bethany, but as Christmas came nearer, she seemed to get worse. I was staying over at my sister's house for Christmas Eve, and Bethany asked me to sleep in her room to protect her from the elf. I said yes. I thought that it was a good idea. Thank you for coming, Doctor. I honestly didn't think the renowned psychoanalyst Jeffrey Gilland would see me. Then again, it isn't every day you are handed the opportunity to interview an insane colleague. And I am your golden ticket to a more profound reputation, aren't I? Please, you don't need that arched brow to impress me. I've spent years trading theory and thesis with you, Jeffrey. Until you published your paper on paranoid delusionals, I thought I was the only one making any progress in schizophrenic research. But I see my banter is falling under speculative regard. Very well. Let's begin with the reaffirmation of patient ID. My name is Professor Randall H. Courtney. I maintain doctorates in the fields of psychology, psychiatry, psychobiology, parapsychology, criminology, and religious mythology. The latter, a particular passion of mine. Until recent events, I was the head of Western University Psychology Department and special consultant to both Western Community Hospital and the state-funded Pleasant Glen Home for the Criminally Insane, specializing in sociopathic and schizophrenic cases. I am 57 years of age, moderately healthy, and unfortunately close to the precipice of insanity. Of course, you wouldn't be here if I were not. To the heart of the matter, as you would tell me when I began a long-winded diatribe, here, then, are the circumstances which led you here. It all began two weeks ago. I had read the case study of the holiday hacker, William James Morton, by Dr. Lansing in Athens. His paper discussed the complete personality and symptomatic juxtaposition of Morton. By all accounts, William James Morton was a classic case of a violent sociopath. He murdered a documented 156 women and children from 1993 to 2013. Undeniably, Morton was the most prolific serial killer ever substantiated in his claims. Um, 
Navy veteran in Afghanistan and a doctor in Ethiopia. In fact, he was so important that he went everywhere and did everything, except for coming home that is. When I was little, I used to love hearing stories about him. I like to imagine that I'd get to meet him someday, and the two of us would go everywhere I heard about in my mother's stories. It wasn't until I was 8 years old when I realized how strained her voice was when she talked about him, or how selfish I was for bringing him up. I didn't ask for any more stories after that, and mom never brought him up on her own. She must have loved him terribly for it to still hurt all these years later. My mother once said, the longer you wait for something you want, the better it is to have. Like interest, building up in the bank. So every day he didn't come home wasn't a punishment. It would only make their reunion that much happier when it finally did happen. It would have been so much easier if he did come back though. I wouldn't have to walk home from school because mom would be there to pick me up. And I wouldn't have to make my own dinner because mom wouldn't need a second job in the evening. Some nights I tried to stay up until she got back. But I'd usually fall asleep on the couch watching TV and wouldn't see her until the morning when she woke me up in my bed. The older I got, the more my mother's stories didn't make sense. Even if only one of them were true, he must have had one opportunity to visit by now. Army contracts are only four years, and if he was as rich and important as she said, then he must have been able to send a little money so my mom wouldn't have to work so hard. The only explanations I could think of were that he was either dead or lost. If he was dead, I intended to find out where he was buried, so mom wouldn't have to keep waiting. If he was lost, I'd help him find his way home again. A friend suggested that my parents might have gotten a divorce and didn't love each other anymore, but I didn't think that was true. Mom wouldn't still be hurt if she didn't love him. And I didn't think it was possible for anyone not to love my mom. So I started my search. I asked my grandparents on my mother's side, but they were tight-lipped and quick to change the subject. I spent my lunches looking for him online on the school computers, but there were hundreds of people with the same name, and I only had a single grainy photo to compare it with. He might have gained weight or grown a mustache or even lost an arm in battle, for all I know. The one thing I was sure about was he never changed his name, because if he was lost, he'd want to be found again. So I started going down the list of hundreds of people with the right name, and sending them each a message asking them if they were my dad. Most didn't reply. Some seemed concerned. Others creepy. But I didn't let that bother me. I started out with my city, Serenity Falls, but quickly expanded my search to the whole state of Wisconsin. Around Christmas every year, kidnappings, murder, and suicide rates go up drastically as well. Even when horrid things like this happen, people often feel, yet rarely do they admit, that they still feel a kind of holiday magic behind it although be it a dark magic. One example comes from a Christmas demon known as the Krampus. The Krampus is well known in countries like Germany and Switzerland for taking naughty children in the dead of Christmas Eve night. Here is one such account. December 6, 2013 my name is Eli Rockford. I am currently seven years old as I write this. I confide in this journal something I can't tell my family because they would never believe me. I am often told that I am very smart for my age because I say and do things that most kids my age don't. But if I tell a strange story, no matter how hard I get them to believe me, my parents and siblings say it's just my imagination. Today I looked out my window into the street by our house. 
and saw a man who looked like a shadow with horns. His eyes glowed orange, and seeing him scared me a lot. He was ringing a bunch of bells for something, but I just tried to ignore him and sleep. Then I heard a knock on the door. I went down to see who it was for mommy and daddy, but when I got to the door, someone stuck a card through our mail slot and ran off real quickly. The card had a picture of a monster who had bull legs, a tail, and horns on a scary looking goat head that looked half human. I was so scared that it was the thing in the street, but I don't know what to do. I think I know what it is, but I hope I'm wrong. I showed the card to my dad, and he says it was Krampus. The bottom of the card said, Gross van Krampus. Daddy says every year, Krampus punishes bad boys and girls on Christmas, but Santa gives good boys and girls toys. So now I'm not so scared. I always get toys on Christmas, so I must be a good kid. I still didn't tell him about the thing on the street. December 24th, 2013 My parents will be gone for most of tonight and Christmas morning tomorrow for some stupid work thing. The time that we loved more than any other. In some ways, the past year had been like an eternity. In others, as if it had succumbed to time in the blink of an eye. But either way, he was glad to see the back of it. Staring at the Christmas tree, its beautiful lights casting a warm hue over the room and the snow quietly falling outside as the sun set, Pete began to think of this past year, of his daughter, Lana, and his wife, Janet. It had started with a very normal December, twelve months earlier, the residents spending most of their days clearing driveways and Pete's wife going off for one of her usual wanders. She had been gone for a couple of hours, but while Janet was utterly devoted to her family, she still needed moments to herself, to clear her head, to diminish the stress that comes with a loving yet disorganized husband and a little girl who was kind, but whom enjoyed trying her parents' patience as much as possible. When the tensions of a domestic life clouded her feelings or began to weigh on her spirits, Janet would wander out of the back door into the fields and woodlands, which characterized the entire area, and trek for a little while through the pines which dotted the landscape. It therefore wasn't unusual for her to be gone for fairly long periods, especially since it was around that time of year when she would take it upon herself to choose the Christmas tree. No matter how much Pete or Lana asked to help out, this was Janet's job. She loved the tradition of it, the process of choosing the best possible tree, cutting it down, and then seeing the bright smiles on her family's faces as they would gleefully take the tree indoor and decorate it with sparkling glitter garlands, warm glowing lights, and an array of festive baubles. It was a small highland town where they lived, far away from any major city, but Janet and the rest of her family loved their home, the simplicity of it, the feeling of being an integral part of a close-knit community, and of course, the beautiful surroundings, lush during the Scottish summer and cold, crisp, stark, but yet awe-inspiring in the winter. Most importantly, she loved the pine woods nearby, specifically a collection of trees which sat at the top of a small hill within the walking distance from the house. Perfect for picking a Christmas tree. She would return there each year, and while their numbers thinned due to a few other neighbors going there for the exact same purpose, 
there were enough trees to last a good many years. When she had been gone for three hours, Pete began to grow nervous. As this was longer than usual, and since it was getting dark, he took it upon himself to venture outside, telling Lana to lock the doors after him and that he would not be long. Lana laughed when he told her that he expected that Mummy would be struggling through the snow with a huge tree, bigger than any that they had ever had before. I'll never forget that elf. The one that terrorized me only a few weeks ago. I consider it a miracle I'm still here today to tell you about it. It all started the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday. I had just gotten home with my family, mum, dad, and my five-year-old brother, Carson. We'd been shopping all morning, you know, waiting in lines trying to get the good deals, the whole thing. When we arrived home, I was the first one to open the door, and that's when I saw it. There, on the coffee table in our living room, was a bright, shiny red elf, just staring at me. I froze. That wasn't there when we left. How did it get there? I was pushed through the rest of the door by my brother, who saw the elf but with a much happier reaction. He ran to grab it when my mother came through the door and yelled, Carson, stop! My brother froze and looked back at her in confusion. I did as well. My mother hurried over to the elf and said, Now both of you sit down and listen very carefully. I was still confused as hell. What was she up to? Still not knowing, I complied and sat next to my brother on the carpet facing my mum. Now this here is a very special elf, one who must not be disrespected. She then bent over and picked up a book sitting next to the elf, opened the front cover and began to read. This is an elf on the shelf. He is a special scout elf who zips back and forth to the North Pole every night and reports to Santa on whether or not the children he is looking after have been naughty or nice. She went on. Once a family has adopted an elf, they must give it a name for it to receive its Christmas magic. Christmas magic? What a bunch of bull. I was 12 years old at the time and was well past my days of believing in Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. I certainly now wasn't going to believe some stupid elf was going to come alive with Christmas magic. Each morning, the elf returns to his adopted family and is in a different place within the house, she continued. Sounds fun, doesn't it? I was way too old for this crap. I mean, seriously, who would believe this bullshit? And then looked at my brother who was rocking back and forth, cackling and clapping his hands with joy. My mother went on. Now there are only two simple rules that all children must follow with an elf in the house. First is that the elf can never be touched. If an elf is touched, it might lose its Christmas magic. Thus, it won't be able to fly back to the North Pole anymore. Second, an elf cannot speak or move in any way while anyone in the house is awake. Remember, an elf's job is to watch and listen. I seriously couldn't believe what I'd just listened to. You expect me to believe this crap? I objected. James! She yelled at me. I was still looking at her with the same look a child might give when told he has to share his toys with his brother, which I hated. This is stupid. I'm too old for this. I said again, this time trying harder to get my point across. My mum walked into the kitchen and yelled behind her. James, come in here now! I followed her, and when I arrived, she grabbed my arm, bent over and looked me square in the eye. Whenever I was thirsty when I was a little kid, I'd always decide to finish the glass in the kitchen instead of bring it up to my room. I don't know why, just one of those stupid things I did as a kid. As I was sipping the water, I heard noises come from down in the den, where we had our Christmas tree. It sounded like a big bag. I peered my head around the wall leading down the stairway to the den, but it was a little too dark to see who could be down there. I actually thought maybe it was my mom, so I started walking down the stairs and the rustling of the bag stopped. I turned down the couch side lamp, and there I was, greeted with a massive man, both in height and size, wearing a red suit and hat, and a familiar long white beard. It was Santa Claus. He waved me over, and I nervously but excitedly walked over to him. He patted my head, and said he was just delivering my presents from his black bag. I looked at the bag, which seemed to be full of small boxes. 
tried to get a peek in the bag, but he stopped me and said, No, no, don't do that. It's a surprise. I noticed there were already some presents under the tree. He turned me around and whispered in my ear, I need to go back to bed. For some reason, I didn't go. I just turned around and kept looking at Santa. Eventually, he actually started walking me up the stairs, telling me we need to be quiet. He asked me which way my room was, and then he told me to go up the second flight of stairs. That was when I actually obeyed him. I looked down the stairs when I was at the top, and all I saw was the eerie figure of the Santa Claus looking up at me. I realized he turned off the nightlight as I was walking up the stairs. I went to my room and shut the door, excited that I just saw Santa. As I tried to fall back asleep, I heard a loud bang from downstairs in the den. The sound traveled all the way back up to my room. I assumed that was Santa leaving the house. The next morning, I woke up early to my mom's screams downstairs. I ran down to the den, where my mom and dad already were, to a disturbing and confusing scene for my young self. There were no presents under the tree, and the sliding window was broken. I don't mean the glass was shattered, I mean it was slammed shut so hard it got knocked off the sliding mechanism. I confusedly asked my parents what happened, and explained that I saw Santa last night. When I told them this, they frantically tried getting as much info out of me as possible. My dad called the police, and when I asked him about the story for fresh details before writing this, he said the 911 operator said on the line that two other calls for the same incident had come in that morning. Apparently a man dressed as Santa Claus was targeting certain houses with accessible windows, and he was stealing the gifts under their Christmas trees. I believe there's a special place in hell for that man. My parents had to tell me later that day that Santa isn't real, and that should anything like that ever happen again, not to trust it. I once worked as a night security guard for a brief, horrible part of my life. It was for many places, but for the longest time, a mall in Chicago, which I'll leave the name out so that the story can in no way get traced back to me. As the lone night security guard in a huge city mall, it was very relaxing and laid back. But of course, working graveyard hours was the worst, especially when I had to do it on Christmas Eve night. I did my regular pacing back and forth the wide halls of the mall, occasionally having a seat by the big center Christmas tree which would stay lit 24-7. After getting a coffee from a security Today was the annual holiday potluck. My office doesn't really do parties, but every occasion gets a potluck. It's business as usual, except everyone brings food. We work while stuffing ourselves silly. Nothing like working through a stomach ache, right? It's always a game of food poisoning roulette. Since I was the first one in, I was expected to do the basic setup. Dutifully, I cleared off the sorting table and got the coffee going. I expected to spend the first 30 minutes of my shift in peace, but it wasn't to be. The phone started to ring. It's too early for this, I thought. I answered anyway, putting on my best customer service voice. At this hour, most customers hadn't had their coffee yet, so answering the phone was a crapshoot. Fortunately, it was only Carol. Thank God you answered. Can you let me in? My arms are full. She always brought enough baked goods for everyone to have seconds and thirds. It was one of the few things I looked forward to. I'll be right over, hold on. I hung up and hurried over to the employee entrance. I yanked open the door and found Carol standing there with a heaping stack of Tupperware in her arms. The scent of gingerbread hung around her like a warm Christmas perfume, sweet and inviting. Let me help you with that. You tried to get it all on one trip, huh? I carefully grabbed a few of the containers, making sure not to tip them over and walking with her inside. Carol smiled appreciatively relieved she could finally set everything down. I took a peek at the goodies, as expected, gingerbread cookies, 
gingerbread office workers, each one bigger than my hand and intricately detailed. What do you think? She asked, puffing out her chest with pride. I made one for everyone in the office. After I pass these out, I'm out of here, though. I'm not working today, but I wanted to make sure everyone got theirs. Wow. I admired her handiwork. It only took me a moment to realize that the gingerbread cookies were modeled after our co-workers. I looked eagerly for the one she'd made of me, but I didn't see one. These must have taken you forever to make. The details are perfect. No one can top these. Suddenly, my crockpot of meatballs seemed a lot less exciting. Oh well, it wasn't a competition. As if I could beat Carol's Christmas cookies. By then, my phone started to ring, so I hurried back to my desk. I watched Carol pass out her cookies with care, placing them on desks atop pretty poinsettia plates. I gave my scripted answer to the angry customer, distracted and deadpan. By the time the call was done, Carol came over with a smile, bringing the very last cookie over to me. I'd say it's too pretty to eat, except he was never really a looker, was he? I looked down at the gingerbread man. It wasn't me. It was our boss, Dale. This one's mine? I asked tentatively, definitely confused. Maybe there was a mistake? Of course! How many opportunities do you get to bite your boss's head off? I wanted to give you the honor. If Carol sensed my disappointment, she didn't let on. I looked down at the cookie again, a dense gingerbread man in a cheap suit. Even though the suit had been made of glaze and frosting, I had that impression. Cheap, ill-fitting, and gray. A perfect replica of one of his two suits with a garish Christmas tie. As long as it doesn't taste like Dale. To be honest, as perfectly made as the cookie was, I didn't find it appetizing. Well, I did. It smelled amazing. But there was something off-putting about eating a cookie shaped like someone else. Especially Dale. Then again, it would be just as weird to eat one that looked like me. Cookie cannibalism. You didn't give him one that looks like me, right? I shuddered, and now that would be creepy. Dale was a real piece of work, but I had to tolerate him if I wanted to keep my job. Of course not. Carol assured me. Could you do me a favor? Wait until everyone else gets in before you eat it. I want everyone to see. I wish I could see the looks on their faces. You'll tell me, won't you? Sure. I slid the gingerbread away from me. To be honest, I wasn't sure if I was going to eat it or not, but I didn't want to hurt her feelings. Maybe if I scraped the decorations first? That seemed equally rude, though. When you eat gingerbread cookies, are you the kind of person to go for the head or the arms and legs first? Or maybe you'll pull off the decorations one by one. She asked suddenly. Carol wasn't looking at me when she asked. She was looking towards Dale's office. What a weird question. Especially coming from her. When she saw the look on my face, Carol laughed and she patted my shoulder. Sorry. I was having a funny thought. There's a little sadist in everyone, isn't there? Excuse me? Grabbing her empty Tupperware, Carol gave me a wink and wished me a Merry Christmas. She left, leaving me alone in the office. I kept dying the gingerbread Dale, still feeling a bit weird about it. Weird, but also hungry. The cookies smelled divine. Which was odd, considering I'd never been a huge fan of gingerbread. About ten minutes later, the rest of my co-workers trickled in. They complained about how tired they were, 
morning traffic and the holidays. Of course, the belly aching became exclamations of delight when they discovered the cookies set neatly on their desks. Everyone started showing one another their cookies and taking pictures, marveling at the perfect...